Hello PennDOT Community Traffic Safety Partners. Thank you for joining us for another video which is being produced for you by the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia Center for Injury Research and Prevention. In this video, Chapter 13a, we'll start talking about qualitative data collection methods for your program evaluation. Specifically, we'll address the benefits and limitations of focus groups and interviews, how to conduct them, how to identify, recruit, and incentivize your participants, the do's and don'ts for developing questions, and we'll provide you with some example questions that you can use for your own qualitative data collection. The main difference between focus groups and interviews is simply that focus groups provide us an opportunity to have group discussions to understand beliefs, knowledge, attitudes, and perceptions that people have on a specific topic. In-depth interviews, on the other hand, are deep one-on-one -on -one discussions that provide us with a detailed picture of how individuals think or feel about a particular topic. The values and benefits of focus groups are primarily that they're very easy to do and it allows us to obtain results from a number of people in a short period of time. Sometimes the social interactions of focus groups can also produce really wonderful complex responses and free discussion among participants that can yield wonderful data. They also allow us to probe for clarification so that we're sure that we're getting the answers to the questions that we're intending to ask. The main limitations of focus groups are that they require highly skilled moderators to perform and they're often difficult to assemble. But don't let this scare you from trying focus groups if you've never done them before. It might take you a few to be feeling comfortable with asking questions and learning how to troubleshoot, but we'll provide you with more details about how to do this in Chapter 13b. It's also important to remember that focus group responses are not independent of one another. And because our groups are hand-selected, they're not always representative of our entire target population. Interviews also have a number of benefits. They're wonderful for gaining deep insight into a topic and allowing respondents to really share their own opinions with their own language about what matters and is most important to them. They're also wonderful for getting quotes and stories they're particularly useful when it's hard to bring a group together. And there are some topics that are just too personal or sensitive to discuss in a group. But like focus groups, these are sometimes difficult to do. You'll have to practice with interviews to get the hang of it. It's also sometimes hard to find diversity in participants because the type of people who volunteer for interviews are often willing, active, and able people who are very excited to give their opinions. And this might not be so typical of the average person in your target audience. And interviews can be very time consuming because you're only getting information from one person at a time. Let's take a closer look at these methods. Focus groups typically take place with six or seven to as many as 10 people with common characteristics relating to a discussion topic. These are carefully planned discussions because all of your questions should be predetermined, which doesn't mean that you won't ask additional questions, but you need to go in with a clear plan. This will help us to obtain a perception in a defined amount of time, typically 45 to 60 minutes. These take place in an environment that's also comfortable and familiar to our participants. The how of a focus group is that it's typically done by a trained interviewer or moderator, and we typically need at least three focus groups to be able to draw conclusions for our program evaluation or our study. The reason why we conduct focus groups is that they allow us to collect qualitative data to determine feelings, perceptions, and the way people are thinking about our programs and what we're offering. They also allow for interaction with people, which is very important not only for the people in the focus groups, but also for us as program implementers to be able to hear firsthand what people are interested in having in their uh, programs. And because people sometimes feel more comfortable disclosing their opinions once they've heard others do the same, focus groups are excellent for promoting self-disclosure. It's also important that we not take our clients, our customers, or the target audience that we're serving for granted. And focus groups provide a way to get uninhibited feedback and have one-on-one -on -one communication so that these individuals know that we're deeply interested in their opinions and making our programs better. Focus groups can take place at any time, before your program begins, while your program is currently happening, or after your program ends. And they typically work best when people are highly motivated to share, or if our goal is to understand their behaviors. But they're not very effective if people are divided on an issue, if they're angry, 
or if our goal is to simply gather factual information. In that case, a survey might be a better tool to use. Interviews typically take place with individuals who represent important constituencies that we're working with. They're carefully planned, like focus groups. All of your questions should be obtained in advance. Now, again, this is not to say that you won't come up with more questions once it starts, but an interview guide is a helpful way to make sure that you have consistency across your interviews and also to provide you with a plan to fill your time. More than 10 questions might be too many to ask. Again, these will take place in a non-threatening environment and sometimes over the phone and can provide us with rich data. They also give us lots of opportunity to probe for clarity and deeper understanding and allow respondents to explain their opinions in their own terms. Like a focus group, interviews can happen at any point in our program implementation or evaluation and should be conducted at a time that works best for the participant. Plan on practicing with interviews several times before you feel comfortable being trained enough to be successful with interviewing people. And know that when it comes to the right number of interviews to draw conclusions, studies have shown ranges from anywhere to as few as eight interviews to as many as 30. But much of this will depend on the information that you're trying to gather and how long your interviews are. It's important to try to develop a rapport with our interviewee and to make them feel comfortable and to take advantage of unexpected leads. And it's also important to be non-judgmental when we ask for details. How can you identify participants for your focus groups and your interviews? One of the first things that you'll need to do is set what's called inclusion and exclusion criteria. These are the criteria that clearly spell out who you want to participate. Is it people who have attended perhaps a certain number of sessions in your program or people who would go to a certain school or live in a certain geographic location? In order to maintain control of the selection process, you'll want to use your inclusion and exclusion criteria to guide you. It's also helpful to use resources of sponsoring organizations if they can reach out to participants for you. And to be aware of bias, we want to make sure that we don't always recruit the same people and that we don't recruit such a small subset of our target population. When possible, develop a pool of eligible participants and then randomly select from those people. When it comes to recruiting for your focus groups, you might already have contacts in your organization. You might be able to piggyback off of those contacts to get referrals, or simply recruit on location when you're delivering your program, or do random phone screenings for people who have participated. Ads in newspapers, community bulletin boards, and social media postings have also been shown to be exceptionally helpful. Incentivizing participants can ensure that they show up on time, actively ready to go. Money, gift cards, and food are all customary, as are pertinent gifts, and if somebody is taking public transportation to join a focus group or interview, it's also customary to provide them with transportation reimbursement. And if you don't have the resources to incentivize with money or gifts, think about just giving a positive, upbeat invitation. How can you develop successful interview and focus group questions? Be clear, be simple, and be non-judgmental. Any new terms, concepts, or ideas should be explained up front. And remember to start people with warm-up questions, questions that don't take a lot of thought, but can just get them talking. Organize your questions by block and theme. Question wording should also be simple. Avoid questions that ask two things in the same question. Only one item per question is most desirable. And avoid using questions with the word not in them because they're very difficult for people to understand. Close-ended questions do not provide rich qualitative data, so keep questions as open-ended as possible to invite numerous responses. Be prepared with probing questions, but also open to exploring new leads that your participants might come up with that you wouldn't have previously thought of. Some example questions for you to consider. What kinds of experiences have you had with regards to driver's education or behind the wheel training? How do you think your driving skills compare to other people your age? How have your driving experiences with your license compared with those from when you had your learner's permit? What are your biggest fears about driving? Do you know anyone who has had a serious accident from distracted driving? Can you tell me more about their experiences? You'll note that all of these questions were not only open-ended, but came with follow-up questions and probes, 
We hope that these will be helpful in getting you started and brainstorming open-ended questions for your focus groups and interviews. You have just finished watching Chapter 13A on Qualitative Data Collection. We reviewed methods, participants, and questions. In Chapter 13B, we'll talk more about the delivery of focus groups and interviews, we'll share with you some ideas for troubleshooting, and we'll talk about how to get started with your analysis and reporting of your qualitative findings. Thanks for watching.